and uh, I was encouraged in my invitation to think about some of the general issues around the conference as well. And I, I can't help thinking that uh, raising the issue, do we, to what extent does macroeconomics need rebuilding? After all, um, we don't, don't, probably don't need to rebuild macro to understand that um, loopholes in financial regulation will eventually be exploited. And if you think that was the cause of the last crisis, then um, it's not so obvious that we need it for even for avoiding the next crisis. Nevertheless, of course, rebuilding macro, understanding psychology and so on, is certainly good science. Uh, but I would emphasize also, of course, that if we're going to rebuild macro, it might be important to think of the micro foundations. Um, so, session title and David Labson, actually I was told originally he was going to talk about using model-free data, and I'm going to come perhaps to that in due course. <laughs> and Douglas Holmes influencing the narrative. So narrative economics, I, I actually find this rather, uh, some fascinating ideas, although I, I'd be happier perhaps if they were taken in directions that, that uh, Douglas may not um, so far, but anyway, there's some great ideas here, and of course there's a long tradition, persuasion. Uh, Austin, the Oxford philosopher, wrote about how to do things with words, and some of that's what's going on here, though I think he was more interested in you had to say things to get married, anyway, and the rhetoric of economics. Greenspan, well, we've already heard this, right? Since I'm be becoming a central banker, I've learned to mumble with great incoherence. If I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what I said. <laughs> That's how it was in the 80s. Janet Yellen, uh, again, uh, Douglas quoted, for the first time, the FMOC was using communication, mere words, as its primary monetary policy tool. The FMC had journeyed from never explained to a point where sometimes the explanation is the policy. So what a big change, and I think probably for the better. <laughs> Actually, uh, Michael McMahon is here, so I hope that he will raise some other questions in connection with central bank communications, because he's worked rather extensively on, on the topic with, with co-authors. So I will mention his work and, and pass on. Now, um, of course, words can be data in other senses too. So a few years ago, there was a, um, an MSc student writing a dissertation, very interested in music. And so the topic she came up with in the end was to construct an index of mood based on the lyrics of popular songs and a, and a textual analysis. So she applied something like computational linguistics <coughs> to try and con construct an index of mood. And uh, then she related it to US GDP. And uh, of course you might think, well, improved me mood would lead to higher GDP, and higher GDP might improve mood. Which of those? Well, there seems to be some evidence for both, as one, one might expect. So text to analysis can be used as data in that kind of way, perhaps. There's a literature on laboratory games where talk has become important, cheap talk. And the cheap talk can either be structured, so the game theorist thinks, well, you should be making a demand in an ultimatum game or something like that. That's the kind of communication. So experimental subjects are restricted to messages, usually numbers, usually single numbers, according to what game theorists think should be relevant. Or they can use natural language. They can exchange short text messages through the intermediation of the way the game is set up without restriction. And there's some evidence that natural language works much better. I'll now move towards uh, David's talk and behavioral biases. Um, so model free data could you chose not to talk about that? Because <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help thinking, what does model, model free data look like? So maybe, maybe the Christmas bird count in the US, they go around and they count birds. and diff um, So that's data. Is there a model? Well, if the data is going to be interesting, you certainly need to fit it within a model. 
And in a sense, you've got a model in geography where mm -hmm. the birds are observed, the species, the, and then if you're going to interpret ecology, population dynamics. So model-free data, I don't think, is a great idea. And of course, in economics, data on national income only started to be compiled after Simon Kuznets and others had invented the concept. So we needed a, a, a model or theory even before you could think about data on national income in a serious way. But David's talk was about what I'm going to call behavioral welfare economics, not alone in this. And he sticks to a simple, pragmatic framework on the whole, even like Keynes perhaps, but it still leaves significant questions, even methodological questions. So at some stage, we're trying to build a bridge between the facts of behavioral biases and the values of what we think policy objectives should be. Uh, Hume's law, the fact-value distinction, may be a distinction between positive economics, which is perhaps purely descriptive, and normative economics, which doesn't disregard the facts, of course not, but it includes elements so it becomes prescriptive. It incorporates ethical value judgments, maybe even interpersonal comparisons. Lionel Robbins often said, well, you shouldn't make them. What he actually said was that they would be uh, unscientific. It still should be made, quite possibly. Um, of course, Adam Smith, the theory of moral sentiments, had an impartial spectator, which is not perhaps a bad way of thinking about formulating an ethical objective if you're just looking at one individual, which is mostly what Adam Smith wanted to do. Um, but, uh, and of course, some people talk about benevolent dictators, but we probably want dictators even to be, to do good things, to do things, rather than just wish for things. So perhaps we need utilitarian moral sentiments for impartial benefactor. Um, and of course, what's key, we, we certainly need an, a, a very rich concept of utility and the consequences which affect utility. So when I talk about utilitarianism, as I do, and as I think David is using a utilitarian objective, uh, in practice, of course you have a simple framework of your purposes, but it should be very rich. Um, now, so there was a time when the judgment from facts to values was made very quickly and simply. So Christopher Archibald, Welfare Economics, Ethics and Essentialism claimed that welfare economics could be made entirely descriptive simply by limiting oneself to identifying policies that are Pareto improvements relative to the, the, the preferences which individuals reveal by their behavior. And that uh, you might call a consumer sovereignty value judgment, and Abba Lerner wrote about this. Uh, Ian Little uh, criticised Archibald rather heavily because, of course, it has nothing to say about distribution, for, for one thing. And, of course, there's much more going on than, than this analysis suggests. And the behavioural revolution, of course, emphasises that. So if we're going to go beyond consumer sovereignty, then, of course, Bernheim and Rangel uh, have their paper and QJ, and there are some of my... So those are Stanford colleagues and some Warwick colleagues moved on, um, have also written recently a similar framework. Um, and by the way, when I when I mentioned behavioral models, I, it occurred to me this morning that in discussing behavior, we're not only interested in behavior, we should be interested as well in the beliefs and the motivations and the explanations for that behavior. And if we can observe that in people's surveys or seeing the narratives that they conduct when discussing what to do, that is useful evidence. And somehow we, the data which we might be able to acquire by looking at that is important. And um, even in laboratory games, we can learn things perhaps by observing not just what people do, but what they believe the other players are going to do. By the way, the, um, some of this work is on changing frames, and it may have forgotten that Hassani wrote about variable tastes, endogenously variable tastes. Christian van Weizsäcker as well, and even I made a contribution in the 
But we're interested in normative value judgments in economics. So the big questions are, what helps people's lives flourish, which is what an impartial benefactor should be helping them towards. At least that's, that's my view. What behavioral biases and other psychological realities and human frailties get in the way of people's flourishings? And what, if anything, should an impartial benefactor be doing to help <coughs> remedy these biases? And a significant complication, which David not, did not discuss for, for obvious reasons, had a useful framework, derived some wonderful con conclusions, but paternalism violates autonomy, which is an important part of human flourishing in itself, so you have to be careful there. We can ask, should people be free, left free to make mistakes? And in some contexts, yes, because they may learn from them, perhaps. <coughs> and, by the way, this suggests that even before worrying about expectations, which was supposed to be the theme of this session, we may well need better concepts of welfare more, ge more generally. Incomplete models. George Box, a statistician, said well, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Schumpeter, when discussing innovation, his work suggests to me that even a model which may be useful today is tomorrow likely to be much less useful, possibly even entirely useless. Now, a line of work which seems to have got <coughs> forgotten is uh, George Shackle. Now, logical surprise. And here's a quotation from him. Um, in contrast with this, and that's referring back to a hypothesis that has been looked at and rejected, I define an unexpected event as one which has never been formulated in the individual's imagination which has never entered his mind or been in any way envisaged. So this goes way beyond Knightian uncertainty, radical uncertainty. It's things which aren't even in, in the model. And I, and I wrote something along, exploring some of those ideas some, some years ago. This relates to something which Taleb felt was intractable when he book The Black Swan. So he treated what he called grey swans, associated with events which can be described well enough in advance so you can regard them as improbable. They're supposed to be improbable events. But if they're improbable events, you can at least describe them. So he, and he regarded as intractable the true black swans that may not have been imagined before their discovery. So, tentative conclusions. Probably my time is nearly up. Um... So David and collaborators have begun or promises to become a fruitful study of how behavioral biases in financial decision making, saving and consumption behavior, may affect policy recommendations in public finance. Not necessarily macro, but I guess it's somewhat related it to macro. Of course, there's also a revised understanding, I think, that leading to of some basic macro concepts like the marginal propensity to consume which Keynes, I guess, called a psychological law, um, and, and Richard Kahn's multiplier was based on that. And, of course, there are some striking empirical results which, which offer, perhaps, better foundations for old-style macroeconomists than uh, we've had up to now. So maybe we need to go backwards <laughs> rather than just forward, probably in both directions simultaneously. And finally, the work on narratives, Douglas Holmes collaborators has implications that may well go go beyond central banking or even financial markets I think you were interested mostly in their implications for markets but markets are only one particular kind of institution in fact it's not just one and there are many different kinds of markets it seems to be remarkably difficult to design markets to work well as our experiences with financial markets recently or 10 years ago suggest so communication is important to all the functioning of all such institutions, and political institutions as well, by the way. And after all, when it comes to narratives, political narratives seem to be ruling our lives these days much more than economic narratives, and not always for the good, of course. So, um, and narratives may influence what kind of model we use to discuss such issues. 
So, good start, promising first steps, but we have conceptual issues that remain. So, thank you to both speakers. Thank you for the invitation.